Good morning, church. Those at home and in presence, I'm glad that God figured it out for just the right amount of people to come. Amen. So uh, today's lesson, I'm going to take a break from doing Hebrews 11 uh, to address some issues and the fact that I've been listening to a lot of reggae as I've been running this week. So there may be a few Bob Marley references in here. So uh, the title of today's lesson is Captivity has the potential to set you free. Captivity has the potential to set you free. So before the exodus, you can see where we're going here, okay, um, which is the movement of the people, okay, the Jews from Egypt were there in captivity. It was actually only when the Israelites felt oppressed that they turned and cried out to God in prayer. In Exodus 3, 9, it says, And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people of Israel out of Egypt. It wasn't until distress had caused man to see their need for God that they cried out for God, and then God came back in to their life. Question, is God trying to get you to focus on him through this captivity because up to now you have not been focused on him? You know, whenever we feel captive to sin or circumstance, the incredible thing about God is that he is ready to be there for us even though we have mistreated him. In 2 Chronicles 6.36 it says, When they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, and you become angry with them and give them over to the enemy who takes them captive to a land far away or near. And if they have a change of heart in the land where they are held captive and repent and plead with you in the land of their captivity and say, we have sinned, we have done wrong and acted wickedly. And if they turn back to you with all their heart and soul in the land of the captivity where they are taken and pray toward the land you have given to their ancestors, toward the city you have chosen, towards the temple I've built for your name. Then from on heaven and your dwelling place, hear their prayers, their pleas, and uphold their cause, and forgive your people who have sinned against you. It is to man's shame that we turn to God only when things go badly. People go, why, why do people turn to God only in those times? It's not because God's done something wrong. Unfortunately, it's because man is ungrateful towards God and the life that we have given us. You know, this week we've been doing Bible discussions and we did one on coronavirus or disease. And uh, the opening question in our Bible discussion was, if you could rename this virus, what would you call it? Because there are some people that have changed the name to China virus, not mentioning any names. Anyway, one of the uh, young Christians who's from China went, I'm going to call it American virus. I thought, okay, well, you had your opportunity there. We had Italian virus. We had get me out of here virus. But the one I liked was antisocial virus. And that was Anna. You know, as Christians, we must make sure as Christians that we do not use this as an excuse to stop loving people and loving God. It is actually the time where we are to prove our Christianity through the way we treat people. You know, today we're going to look at three times that the Apostle Paul was under confinement and see how God used him powerfully. You know, there is always a passage in the Bible for what you are going through, no matter what you are going through. Yeah, we're going to look at how, when Paul was confined in prison in Philippi, Paul was confined in prison in Caesarea, and Paul was confined to house arrest before his trial in Rome. Because you this week may feel a little bit confined over the next month or so. So we're going to figure out how Paul dealt with these situations so that we can imitate him. So point one, we're going to start in Acts 16, verse 22. Point one, expect God to work miracles at this time. In Acts 16, 22, it said, The crowd join in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates order them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they've been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all these prison doors flew open, 
and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. At that hour of night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. And he was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. So my sub point is here, don't just sit there, pray something. You know, Paul and Silas were beaten, flogged, thrown into prison, confined, held captive, and even fastened to just one spot. So we're, we're not that confined. We're talking about, you know what, you're actually in change that you can mostly move this much, or move this much, or move this much. Maybe he could have gone, you know what, well, I've always wanted an excuse not to evangelize. I think this is, this is it, do you know what I mean? I've always wanted an excuse not to read my Bible. So, you know, this is, God will understand this one. Yet, did that stop them having an impact? No. It's never about what you cannot do. It's about what you can still do. You see, I think about these guys. They said, you know what? What we can do is we can sing and we can pray. So you know what we're going to do, Silas? We're going to sing and we can pray. We're not going to talk about the fact that we can't evangelize. We're not going to talk about the fact that we can't read our Bibles or phone our friends. We're going to talk about what we can do. We're going to sing and pray. And if you're struggling in prayer right now, then go and use OneNote. Under the follow-up studies, there's lots of great studies on prayer. Get them, reawaken your prayer life. They started praying and singing. You know, I always sing, I don't know about you, when often I find it hard to pray, what I do is I just start singing. And somehow it just softens my heart. So I'm going, like, I don't, I'm a bit hard-hearted, I don't really want to pray to you, God, but you know what, I can sing. And I start singing and singing. But after about 15 minutes, that singing sort of stops and I start praying. And there's just an insight there. Sometimes it takes singing. That's why we sing at church. People come in a bit grumpy and mm, like this, and we do three, four, five songs. And by the end of it, you're going, hey, I'm happy again. What happened? Who deceived me? What, what? <laughs> I knew there was joy inside me somewhere, but I didn't know how they brought that one out. Okay. But that's what it does. You know, the next week or month, however long these restrictions are for, should be a place and a time where our relationship with God goes up. Yeah. Come on. You know, it's amazing. In Matthew 6, 6, it says, When you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Maybe God's just going to us all. You're not praying enough. You're not obeying the scripture. You're not going into your room and praying. So I'm going to make sure you do by making you stay at home. Wow. You see, we look at this virus from our point of view. What I'm trying to do today is get us to see it from God's point of view. Man, you don't, don't pray enough. So I'm going to put you at home so you get so bored. He may even break your television. <gasps> the internet may even break. <gasps> don't get angry. Pray. You know, I'm proud of the movement. We come together. These are times of great unity. You know, I know Kip sent out the good news email. So tomorrow, as a movement, we will pray and fast for the people that God has put in authority over us so that the world will lower the walls of prejudice and hate that separate nations, thus seeing allow us to spread the gospel more freely. God is working all the time. What we consider restrictions... God views as opportunities. And when we are godly, we can view these as opportunities. Now, the Bible says, pray for kings. In other words, presidents, dictators, governors, mayors, and all those in authority that we may live peaceful lives because God our Savior wants all men and women to be saved to come to the knowledge of truth, 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 4. So God is using this, and we need to pray for our leaders to have God. It's a, I cannot imagine the difficulty that some of these people are going through, the pressure that's going through. I was speaking to my family last night. It's my dad's 85th birthday party. 
I'm saying I'm happy birthday in the morning, everything. My sister works in a hospital in London, so she has to stay and she has to oversee, etc. Under a lot of stress, my sister, as there are many, many people, these people need our prayers. Yeah. But before we pray, we've got to consider, do we need to confess before we pray and fast? Because the Bible says, only the prayers of a righteous person are heard. You know, reminder, secret sin, apathy, neglect of mercy, iniquity, stubbornness, harshness, doubt, self-indulgence. You know, these are all things that stop our prayers being heard. You know, everybody loves it when I confess my sins, so here we go. Okay, we had a marriage D group last night, and, you know, Carrie and I normally lead it, and everybody listens to our wise advice, and then... So we are, we're training up uh, Jesse and Liz to take that over, and they did a great job, and it was fantastic. And by the end of the night, 40 minutes later, I had been discipled by Jesse and Liz and Kerry on my harshness. And I'm sorry, honey. Um, but a bit of Boomerang Bible, they did one of my lessons I did to them, they did to me. That's called Boomerang Bible right there, baby. Yeah. So uh, first of all, great job in leading the marriage talk. Amen. Great job for not backing down from discipling me. Amen. And I'm sorry, honey. Amen. Prayerfully, God will hear my prayers. <laughs> but maybe you've got a little bit of confession to do. You know, don't just sit there. Expect God to work. Psalm 53, in the morning, Lord, I, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you and wait expectantly. This is David going, God, when I pray, I expect you to do something. Paul and Silas prayed. There was an earthquake. Coincidence? Well, if God put it in the Bible, I don't think it was coincidence. God's going, uh, by the way, guys, I did this. You know, they were freed by God to preach and baptize. You see how captivity can lead to setting people free. We often think our situations are restrictive, yet God has us exactly where he wants us to reach out to exactly who wants us to reach out to. How else would this jailer have had the opportunity to hear the gospel. I presume the jail, I always imagine it to be sort of underground or definitely not a place where a Christian who is being hunted down by people like Paul in the, in the past go, hey, I know what, I'll just walk up to a jail and see if they'll arrest me while I evangelize. How do you convert a jailer? Well, God goes, mm, that's a good one. He's open, just needs a bit of work here. Sorry about this, Paul and Silas. You gotta go and get flogged and arrested. <laughs> Get thrown into jail so that you can preach this guy. That's the only way I can do it. And they go, okay, Lord, we'll do whatever it takes. You know, God is working. I think about Sybil here. She had challenges getting Wednesday off. So God said, right, we'll just close the university down. You can come on midweek. We go, oh, that was just coincidence. There is no such thing as coincidence. God either makes something happen or allows something happen. You know, you know, I shared earlier this year about um, studying the Bible with Wellington. And uh, so Wellington got to a point where we were studying the Bible with him. I said, look, you've got to give up your, your job and your career to become a Christian because they just don't match. He was like, no, I can't do all of that and stuff like that. I said that God can take it away. I'm not saying he will, but God can take it away. And his whole business is based around students and being paid a commission to put people into universities and foreign students that have, can stay in this country. And so because of this, I've been phoning him up, <laughs> as you can imagine. And he won't answer my calls. He won't do any of this. And I'm trying to get him and go, mate, I told you that God can take away your business. And I just can't get hold of him. So Kerry said, just pray. Then I get this text from Jesse and Liz. Hey, yesterday, we've just bumped into Wellington. <laughs> Saying, you know, he said he's really sorry and I must be really angry and he'll come to Bible Talk next Friday. Wow. You see, it's not about what you can't do. It's about what you can do. It's about praying. Yeah. You know, God stirs in people's hearts, even though you don't. Know, my friend, uh, Mr. Bennett's here, who paints a lot of crazy models, which we love. Okay, if you play Risk. You know, he texts me and said, hey, are you still meeting? What if I said, no, we're not still meeting. He wouldn't be here today enjoying the service. There are so many people that are oh, more open today that God is working in their lives that we need to go out and get with. And if you can't get hold of them, just pray. Point two, captivate your captive audience. Captivate your captive audience. So we're going to go to the second time that Paul is arrested and in jail. 
And Acts 2, 32, sorry, Acts 24, 23, sorry, Acts 24, 23, said he ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. As Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now, you may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. Don't just sit there, preach something. So Paul had a captive audience. This sounds a little bit more like us. You know, he couldn't leave the imprisonment, but he had his friends to be able to come and visit him. A little bit more freedom here than just being tied down in chains. This seems to sort of be a theme of God, doesn't it? It's like, I've got to throw my righteous people in prison so that they can end up preaching to the people I want to. So here Paul is ending up preaching to Felix. Felix is the governor of the region. How do you get to preach to a politician when you're a Christian being persecuted? God goes, I know, I'll throw you in prison. And then you'll have an audience with him. See, God has you exactly where he wants you at exactly the right time. Paul has a limited audience. So he goes, you know what? I don't know if this guy's open or not, but I'm going to give it everything I've got. If I've only got a couple of people to preach to, man, they're going to have seeking God through to light and darkness, through to the history of the movement. Man, this guy is my audience. I'm going to give him everything. It says he preached on righteousness through light and darkness. You have got to repent, governor. Self-control. Let me talk about your impurity and the judgment to come. There's going to be a hell. Are you ready for it? Are you ready if death comes? Sometimes we can feel like, because this is such a sensitive time, we shouldn't preach about righteousness, self-control, or the judgment to come. That's exactly what we should preach about. That's exactly what God wants us to talk to our friends about. They are more open and more aware of their frailty now than at so many other times in their life. Don't just sit there, contact someone. You know, we live in an age where it is easier to speak to people more than any other age there is. You can phone them, you can email them, you can Skype them, we can WeChat them on Twitter and dinner. I mean, actually, there are so many different apps to contact people, it's ridiculous. People go, hey, did, did you get my message? Uh, on which medium? Well, I only use WhatsApp. Well, I only use WeChat. Well, I only use Facebook. Man. Jeez, literally as a minister, you have to wake up and go click, 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 and go through them all. But there's no excuse for us not to contact people. For some of us, though, we're uncomfortable with these ways of evangelism, especially us older people. Some of you go like, yeah, I know them all, I know this, and you can turn it upside down and put fluffy ears on it and all sorts of stuff. I still haven't mastered that one. But you know what? For some of us, this may be God going, you know what? You've got to get used to evangelizing in ways that you're not used to. Maybe God is trying to upskill you. Let me challenge you. Phone every person in your phone ever. This is a great time to phone people. Why? Because they're at home. They're not at work. People you invited to church before. There are great opportunities. Many, many churches are literally not meeting. I went on various different churches' websites. Our church is really, really set up to handle a situation like this. We have churches broken down into sectors, broken down into Bible discussions. On our, on our website are where all the Bible discussions are, where all the small meetings are. I went on to one of the biggest churches here um, in, in the city. It says, just meet in small groups. Could you find out where these small groups are? No. Absolutely not. There are many churches that just rely on this massive service. And God's gone, no, going to smash that. Let's see if you follow Jesus' teaching of one person discipling another, discipling another, discipling another, discipling another. There are many orphan people who believe in God today because these churches have not built themselves on Jesus' principles of discipleship. A great opportunity. You know, never give up on people. Last week I talked about how Obed, you know, he came back after a year of being away. Um, I think about Andrew Barber. I reached out to Andrew Barber. I met him uh, at Sydney University, and the conversation went, hi, do you want to come to church? Yes. Uh, do you want to talk? No. Uh, can I have your phone number? Yeah. Goodbye. That was it. Nine months I followed up on him. 
for nine months. And I had an iPhone. So when I emailed him, what I didn't realize was that it would come from my email when I texted, which is what if God at yahoo.com, which he thought was some religious nutter. So he never actually replied many times. Then somebody got my number off the internet um, from uh, the Middle East. And there were people just in call centers phoning ministers and really giving them a lot of time, etc., like this. And uh, um, actually, no, it was, I think it was Samsung or something. Again, I'm not very technical. I had one type of phone. So basically, I didn't know how to block it. So I changed phone. And as a result, the next time I was trying to get in touch with Andrew, it didn't come from whatif.com, what, what, uh, what if God at Yahoo, it came from my number. He went, oh, maybe he's stopped being a religious nutter. And he came to church. <laughs> Nine months of follow-up. As a result of that, Alyssa is here. Christine is here. Because just keep on going. I think about reaching out to people that have left God. I try to reach out to as many people, never ever give up on their numbers. Got a text back from Jada. You know, keep reaching out to these people. These people, again, are being limited with what they can do spiritually. Call every family member. Contact people. You know, call people you've never called. How many of your family members would love to hear from you? There cannot be a better reason to call the family members. Because sometimes what happens is you haven't called auntie for a year, right? And so you feel guilty. What do I say? Auntie, I just want to make sure. Are you okay? I can't think of a better time to call the family members that we feel awkward about. Yeah. Set up Bible studies online. So this is a new one for me, okay? I feel weird about this one. But there's this guy called Jarrell. Hey, Jarrell, if you're listening. Um, and William brought him along to a Bible discussion a couple of months ago. And he went over during the holiday to Indonesia. And I've been faithfully keeping up with him, texting him and calling him and everything like this. And anyway, so he said when he got back, he'll come out to Bible discussion. But he got a cold, and now his parents won't let him out. So I sent him to the Bible discussion on Friday about sort of disease, etc. He really loved it. And I went, okay, I was writing this. I go, I need to ask him if he would like to study first principles online through Skype. And just this morning he says, yeah, I'd love to. That's a bit weird for me, doing the Bible studies through Skype. However, I'm like, this is what God is trying to train me. I need to upskill myself. We have you know, Bible discussions online, etc. So just because you can't get with people doesn't mean you can't study the Bible with people. You know, contact people. What a great time to call people in Samoa in our churches there, in Hong Kong, in New Zealand. People have tougher times. So, um, Samoa has gone down to you can only have five people in, in a public place. That's how it's jumped down to. People in other churches. Door knock your street or apartment. You've got to make the most of every opportunity, Ephesians 5.15. Non-Christians are getting flyers going around Australia going, hey, are you aged? Do you need help? We should be doing that. We should be door knocking or putting flyers through people on our street. Let me challenge you as households to do that. Go and see, are there aged people who need food, who need help? There will be some somewhere, and that's a great opportunity for us to be Christians. Yeah. You know, in your households today, in your family times, discuss what you can do, not what you can't do. You know, look at April and go, you know what? I'm going to make it faithful April. Not a time where we retreat and pull back from the mission, but we see the opportunities God has given us and we really, really go for it. And then point number three, let God captivate your time. You ever heard the expression that idle hands are the devil's work? In other words, when people have nothing to do, they sin more than ever. That's just the truth. People are unemployed normally get into bad situations because they've got nothing to do. We need to make sure that during this time, we remain godly. Not even remain godly, we become more godly. Amen. You know, we're going to pick up here in Acts 28, 16. It says, when we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to stand guard. Don't just sit there, read something. You know, Paul here was at the end of his journey, right at the end of the book of Acts. And he was under house arrest after a long and harrowing journey. He'd been shipwrecked. He'd had so many different situations. And he got to Rome, and he didn't fall into a heap of self-pity. But he said, you know what? I may be in a house under house arrest, but I am going to be spiritually productive. So he called for his dear friend Timothy to bring him something to read. In 2 Timothy 4.13, he says, When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, 
and my scrolls, especially the parchments. He didn't sit there and go, you know what? I've got no friends in this town. I've got no situation. He said, Timothy, come bring me stuff so I can get on and do some work. Like Paul today, we need to use this time of restriction to read, not sin. You know, we can read the whole New Testament in a month. You've got to set out and go, what am I going to do? Say I'm locked down for five weeks. What am I going to achieve spiritually in that five weeks? Here's a good challenge. Read the whole New Testament by the end of April. That would be a really good challenge. Think about it. Read your Bible more than you watch TV or phone or internet time. Really, really simple. Go, if I want to watch a show and it's an hour, I need to read my Bible now. If I want to be tempted to watch the next one, I need to read my Bible now. Why? Because otherwise, you know what it's like. You can watch one, two, three, three o'clock in the morning, and we've all been there, done that, okay? Or just fast from them. What? <gasps> you know, Netflix can lead you into sin. Phone time can lead you into sin. How many people fall into pornography, and it's not through a magazine anymore, it's on the internet. You know, uh, read two spiritual books. There are many. There are many on one notes. You know, Chronicles of Modern Day History. I'd, I, so I got them in my bag. But this is Ron Harding's book about the, the history of our movement to really understand where we came from, to handle all the persecution that people have thrown at us. Go through one notes. There's so many lessons, but read something. Tune out from the world and tune in to God. If you keep looking at the internet and all the bad news... It will depress you. Yeah. That's why the good news is called the good news. Okay? You won't find good news at the moment on the internet. Yeah. Come on. So where do you find good news? You find good news in the Bible. So if I was you, if you want to be happy tomorrow, I would read your Bible, not wake up and go, how many people have died as yet? How many of that people did that this morning, right? Okay, where was the latest death toll this morning? Come on. It needs to be God-focused. Yeah. Don't just sit there, write something. Maybe Paul's imprisonment was sent by God to force him to write. During this time in captivity, he wrote the books of Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon under house arrest. Maybe God was going, you know what, I need you to slow down, Paul, and write something because I'm more interested in who you're going to save in 2,000 years than in 2,000 minutes. I think about the Apostle John was sent to prison on the island of Patmos, and he gave us 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and Revelation. Can you imagine the Bible without the 1 John, 2 John, 3 John? They're all about, you must love your brother and sister. The Bible just wouldn't be the same without those scriptures. Come on. Write a new song. Some of you are create, write a new song, let's get it up here. I'm a bit sick of my old songs that I rewrote and whatever like this. You know, you do them. Let's get them up, let's practice them, let's see if they work. Because not all my songs are sung anymore, amen. <laughs> write a new Bible talk. Write a sermon and say, Joe, I've got a cranky sermon, I want to preach it. All right, let's hear it. And if it's great, you'll get to preach, amen. Write a short talk, a great welcome, a communion, a contribution. You know, I think, I'm pretty sure that this week we'll just split men and women going forward. I'll have to figure out the Glover Cottages. But then we'll just go to preach-offs, which I know the women really, really love. So this Wednesday, we'll most probably have women at Glover Cottage with a preach-off and men at Sydney Uni at a preach-off. And we'll also, most probably next Sunday, uh, and I'll just confirm this but uh, tomorrow, but we'll most probably, instead of meeting here, we're actually going to run the marathon on Sunday morning. Okay, so we're going to do the mercy. What that, that'll do, you don't all have to run a marathon. Just those people that have been training for the marathon, okay? <laughs> Nobody will turn up to church then. <laughs> okay. So we start at 8, gives us a couple of hours to do it. Everybody can then come and encourage the people through the finish line. We'll have devotional at Centenary Park at 10 o'clock, and that would be a great way for us to come and also obey the laws of the land by not living in restriction, okay? So that's most probably what we'll do this week. Write an article, write a book, okay? Don't just sit there and listen to something. You know, use our website. There are incredible series on our website. You can go through the whole book of Luke, Joshua, Revelation. I've always wanted to understand Revelation. Go to other church websites. Find a favorite preacher besides me, obviously. Okay, find a favorite <laughs> preacher that's okay. All right. <laughs> um, listen to other people. So there are so many things. Listen to other sermons. Think about going to OneNotes. Maybe you need to refresh your on the Holy Spirit study. Under follow-up studies, Holy Spirit, not only the notes there, 
but every sermon is there so you can really go through six weeks of understanding the Holy Spirit. Get a plan for March and April. Set goals for the week, month, or you'll fall into idleness of sin. Because when you aim at nothing, you get nothing. You know, just an example, you know, maybe Mondays, maybe you break up on Mondays I'll do this, on Tuesdays I'll do this. Like on Mondays I read 15 chapters of the New Testament. I Skype one person to have a Bible study. I call 10 old friends and 10 new friends. One family member and I pray more than I play. I mean, just set yourself some goals. Get in to your family groups and discuss it. Do it as individuals, as a household. Do it as a Bible talk. Do it as couples. Sister with another Bible discussion. Maybe find up Samoa and, you know, maybe it'd be cool if you sort of go, okay, we're going to assist them with Beric's Bible talk. And they're going to do this, and we're going to do this. And we're going to have a whole month in unity with this Bible talk in Samoa. Or in New Zealand, or in Hong Kong, or America. But get creative. You know, for me, I was thinking about, you know, a reggae month. Well, I just was listening to a lot of Bob Marley. And I just thought it was very relevant for this time. And I'm not thinking about No Woman, No Cry, Solomon. Okay, that's not what I'm thinking about. But Exodus, movement of the people. These are some of the things he said. One day the bottom are going to drop out. And I thought, how true that is for the world today. Please don't rock my boat because I don't want my boat to be rocked. Isn't that how people feel all the time? Every little action, there is a reaction. <laughs> you can fool some people sometimes, but you can't fool all the people all the time. Now we see the light, stand up for your rights. <laughs> we used to lead a Jamaican church, actually. Um, get up, stand up, stand up for your rights. Hey, okay. Rejected by society, treated with impunity, protected by their dignity. Okay. Open up your eyes and look within. Are you satisfied with the life you're living? We know where we're going. We won't know where we're from. We're leaving Babylon and we're going to the fatherland. Wow. Don't worry da -da 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 about a thing because every little thing is going to be all right. Okay. <laughs> Wipe away transgressions and set the captives free because every day we pay the price with a little sacrifice. This is my favorite. Emancipate yourselves from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our mind. It's a white man trying to sing it. I'll just read it, okay. <laughs> Have no fear of the atomic energy, because none can stop the time. How long shall they kill our prophets while we stand aside and look? Some say it's part of it. We just got to fulfill the book. Wow. Won't you help me sing these songs? These songs of freedom, because all I ever had is redemption songs. You know, captivity has the potential to set you free if you grab the moment. Expect God to work miracles at this time. If you're here as a non-Christian, God could not be speaking to you louder about the frailty of your life. It's time to set aside all distractions and become a Christian this week. Captivate your captive audience. Don't tell me who you can't reach out to. Get in there with the people that you can reach out to. And let God captivate your time. As we take a day out tomorrow to fast and pray, take a time to plan to make the next five weeks, the last week in March, April, a phenomenal time, individually in your relationship with God, in your household, in your Bible talk, and in the church. And amen to God be the glory. Amen.